Good evening, everybody. This is Melissa Felty, uh, Conservation Education Manager with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And um, first thing I want to say is thank you for uh, attending this webinar. And also, because a lot of people who are on this, they are uh, receiving uh, or doing the credit for the Texas Water Specialist. And I just want to put out a really good congratulations to all the new Texas Water Specialists that are out there. Um, we do have your names and um, the certifications I have not been able to send out because I have not been able to be in the office. I'm hoping to get into the office next week, uh, but I do want to say I have received some emails. Uh, we have um, quite a number of people who in the last couple months have uh, obtained their eight hours of advanced training. So I thank you so much for that. Um, and so now for the um, what to do after you become certified. Uh, according to this website, I'll show you down here, um, to, to have an annual renewal, you need at least 10 hours of volunteer service. And so that may be hard to do right about now. And so uh, I wanted to uh, offer another uh, way to that and to get ours is through our Texas Aquatic Science curriculum. So with our Texas Aquatic Science curriculum, um, it's five years new. Um, and thank you to Rudy Rosen and Sandra Johnson to uh, develop the student portal as well as the teacher guide. So this is where it comes for the volunteer hours. Um, and with the volunteer hours, because we are looking at reviewing and updating the Texas Aquatic Science. There'll be an intern that'll be starting with us uh, June 1st to August 7th. Through, so throughout that time, if anybody is interested, you can fill out um, down here, there's a teacher guide, the access request form, which looks like this. And so you're just gonna put your name um, and then email address and put an email address that I'm able to get a hold of you uh, if you are a teacher, um, if you are working at a nature center that currently isn't open, um, uh, please put an email address that um, I can get a hold of you. Education facility, if you work at an education facility, you can just put that. But if you're a master naturalist, um, I just ask that you put what chapter you belong to and then um, an, an address. We don't send anything out. Um, this is just fields that uh, we needed to collect. And so what you'll be doing is uh, reading, reviewing, and providing any suggestions um, and feedback um, to each of the chapters. So thank you uh, to Sandra Johnson for being the author of this uh, Texas Aquatic Science curriculum. So next we're going to go to um, our speaker. And our speaker is uh, Chelsea Jones. She is a senior research analyst with the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts Natural Resources Program. Chelsea applies her background in environmental science, hydrology, and citizen science to facilitate interdisciplinary approaches to system, excuse me, to support system level resource management decisions. She is the lead subject matter expert on the spot-tailed earless lizard and a multi-species ecosystem assessment of Matagorda Bay. Recently, Chelsea's role has expanded to include extensive public outreach efforts to engage local stakeholders and communicate increasingly complex ecosystem research. Chelsea joined the Comptroller's Office in 2017 after graduating with a Bachelor in Science in Environmental Science from the University of Texas at Austin. And she also enjoys birding, backpacking, and paddling. So thank you, Chelsea, so much for being with us today. And I will change over the screen to Chelsea. Excellent. So with, um, before Chelsea starts, sorry about this. Um, if you have any questions, um, there is a, a chat or a question function. If you're not able, um, and we're also gonna have polls and the polls are just fun or interactive polls. If you're not able to answer the, uh, the polls, if you are on the computer or on your phone, you may have to exit out of full screen mode in order to answer those polls. And so with that, I will give it to Chelsea. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for having me today. Um, of course, I'm always excited to feature my program at the Comptroller's Office. Starting with that first question everybody's got, and in this case, it's how to change slides. 
Is that good? We're moving on. <laughs> so everybody wants to know what exactly is the state's fiscal officer doing in endangered species research? Well, today I'd like to cover a little bit of my agency's goals and how we're involved in the endangered species process, breaking that process down into more detail and putting us into a federal context. And then finally, for all my aquatic folks in the crowd, featuring some ongoing projects that are occurring in different aquatic habitats across the state. So essentially, the natural program, natural resources program is here to work with communities, stakeholders, businesses, and the general public to address some of our conservation challenges across the state. In particular, endangered species issues implicate Texas natural heritage, as well as people that have to interact with that environment. Specifically, we fund research through Texas public universities to answer some of the most pressing questions to our ESA questions. I threw together this infographic for today and you know, you'll see it kind of follow me along in the PowerPoint. Um, I originally wanted to create something linear, but sitting and reflecting on it, it's really not so simple. And in any given day, my team and I are wearing many different hats. So this first one is Identify needs, where folks need us to get engaged with endangered species issues, and what pressing questions should be prioritized. This is really the legwork. But before I go too much further, I think it's important to kind of cover the basics, and in particular, this law that I'll keep referencing. For folks who don't know, the Fish and Wildlife Service is the federal agency responsible for implementing the Endangered Species Act. Now, this is a really big job. Not only do they have to curate the species list, deciding what should come on and what should go off, they also have to use that same information to inform recovery and long-term conservation of that species. In this case, you know, we, we might want to touch base on a few core definitions. You know, what are we talking about? What is an endangered species? Well, according to the act, the endangered species is one that's at risk of becoming extinct and not being present in its natural habitat anymore. A threatened species is one that's likely to become endangered. Of course, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has many responsibilities, and implementing the act is only one of them. You know, for today's purposes, this is really where I'll stay. Um, of course, y'all might be familiar with the service's role in wildlife refugees and things like that, but we're really working in addressing data gaps that can help them implement this process. So to start with our first poll question, what is the people's sense of their aquatic endangered species across the state? All right, excellent. So let me launch the poll. So everybody should be able to see it. And so, like I mentioned before, um, these polls are just for fun, for us to learn, um, for the speakers to see uh, where they should maybe guide their talk. Um, and we generally will have the polls for about 30 seconds. And about 75% of the vote. So we're almost there with each one. And also as a reminder, if you're not able to answer the polls, um, just minimize out a full screen and you should be able to answer the polls then. All right, excellent. So I'm gonna close it, share the results to everybody. And so Chelsea, I'll read them off to you. So 20% said the horn shell, 59% said the snapping turtle, 17% said the pupfish, and 4% said the blind salamander. All right, savvy group. Um, just to recap, alligator snapping turtle is the right answer. Um, our Texas horn shell is an endangered freshwater mussel in the Rio Grande Basin. The Comanche Springs pupfish has long since been listed endangered. It's out in West Texas near Fort Stockton. And the Texas blind salamander is close to home in Austin, Texas, and it too is endangered. The alligator snapping turtle is not 
but it might surprise folks to know that it's currently being considered for listing. So what exactly does that look like? Going back to day six, the Fish and Wildlife Service has laid out a pretty transparent process where folks like my agency, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and stakeholders can get engaged in the endangered species listing process. Let's take the alligator snapping turtle, for example. Some time ago, someone petitioned it for listing. This is usually an external group, but the service can do it itself. The service gives itself about three months from receiving that petition to read it over, make sure it has merit before they'll decide whether they should dive deeper into the status of the species. In the case of the alligator snapping turtle, they agreed that the status should be explored across its range. That kicks off a one year window where the service can start to compile all the best available science to characterize the status of the alligator snapping turtle. Finally, at the end of 12 months, that'll lead to a listing decision where they can decide threatened, endangered, or not warranted. The alligator snapping turtle is here. There's this new feature, you know, maybe the last few years, the service has started to implement the SSA process. This is the species status assessment. And right now, folks are pouring in information they have to service biologists who will then present it in one comprehensive report. Now, in the service's words, they're trying to represent the species now, and what it needs, and how those needs will change into the future. They're looking for representation, redundancy, and resiliency. That boils down to how many are there? Are they genetically diverse? And how will they withstand changes through the future? From our perspective, you have to know a lot of answers to even get that far. What is it? You know, some folks are talking about the alligator snapping turtle might actually be three different species. And East Texas just has one. What does it eat? Where does it live? How many are there? These are the kind of questions that can start to stack against you really quickly. And it goes back to doing the legwork to engage with our partners, figuring out who's taking what question and how we can contribute. So when we get that far, we can start to develop a scope of work. That means that we've highlighted a few questions that we would like to prioritize and we hash out ways we think to go about it. We'll formalize the scope of work and we can either send it out for a competitive bid or start contacting qualified universities. They're all gonna be public schools, um, but because they are technically sister agencies, we have a lot of flexibility for engaging in conversation. It's not just passing a number across the table so much as it's understanding someone's interest in previous experience. Once we've narrowed down a candidate, we can execute a research contract. And this is something that's really important to the work we do. It's distinct from a research grant. Um, other agencies can distribute large sums of money for research grants. And, and those are wonderful because scientists can take that information and run with it. And at the end of the project, provide that agency with a final report. One of the advantages of research contracts is that we're working on real time issues. And as you saw, 15 months is not a long time to operate, particularly in biological science. Contracts let us talk to researchers on a more regular basis and kind of plug them into the public and other stakeholders. It includes things like what other data sets are available and what other questions are people concerned about? So here's a glimpse of some of the contracts we've executed across the state. In the last 10 years, that's over two dozen projects for 12 different species in their habitats. Um, big reason for that two to one ratio is another advantage of research contracts. Sometimes our researchers strike gold. They find a lot of a rare species. They ask one question and it leads to another. 
and we have a lot of flexibility to continue those research programs. So finally, you know, lumping the last two in the infographic here, it's important that we're sharing this information. We have legislative funding and it's essentially taxpayer dollars. So we're making sure that we're meeting some of our core goals and sharing this information with the public. So of course, we're distributing raw data and maps to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, that has a caveat. Um, it's not so relevant to the aquatic discussion today, but all of our research projects have a confidentiality clause. And that's important for terrestrial projects where private land access in Texas can be a really big bottleneck to the kind of work we're trying to do. Um, in this case, landowners can sit at the table and kind of hash out what level of information they're comfortable sharing. And that helps them engage in science um, without so much, you know, challenging the wide set of views and opinions folks have about the Endangered Species Act. Other forms of public communication are on our website, on our newsletters, um, for our larger, more complex projects. Matagorda being one of them, um, we also produce story maps. They're online, but they're more interactive reports that people can navigate. And then finally, if you see anything today that's of particular interest, a lot of times we're hosting work group meetings. So public meetings are, are broad, they're putting out sort of introductory information. And work group meetings allow very focused groups to sort of needle into those particular priority questions. I always like to note that academics and universities have their own avenues of communication. Um, things like conferences and journal publications. But we really encourage peer review. In many cases, it's hard for the public to access those avenues. Journal articles cost money. Um, conferences have large initiation fees. So we try to prioritize putting our reports online, and available to the public and encouraging our researchers to pursue peer review in other avenues. So what's a good example of this process playing out? Well, I always like starting with the Rio Grande Cooter. Um, one, it's, it's a quick, you know, sort of nicely defined project that ended up having a really big impact. In this case, we knew the service is considering listing the cooter or not in 2021. Now, for anyone who was taking notes a few slides ago, you might notice that's kind of funny. And how does that fit into our 15 month timeline? Well, in reality, the service has a big backlog of species that they have to consider for listing. A couple years ago, they were receiving petitions that can include more than 100 species for a given region, and they were simply overwhelmed. So the 15th month process is their plan to systematically chew through that backlog and start to address these species needs. So early documents, in this case, the CUDA was 2012, 2013. Um, early documents were talking about the threat of dams and poor water quality or pet trade for a turtle that was living in the Rio Grande Basin. Now, the story gets sort of thicker as you do more legwork. Basics of the species, besides that it's got that charming red pattern, is it's herbivorous, you know, mostly. Um, which is anyone who likes to fish is in the audience, you'll know that it's kind of hard to catch herbivorous aquatic animals. It's sort of waving a piece of lettuce in the salad bar. In this essence, they were just avoiding traditional baited trap methods. On top of that, they're really shy. And I know that's not a new idea for turtles, but it becomes a challenge when they won't show up in your trap. And if you get anywhere near them on foot or by boat, they're gonna hide. So, in continuing this legwork, it was interesting how some of these behavioral features of the turtle were impacting our understanding of it. And as a result, it kind of encouraged us to pursue how could we find them better. And, you know, in 2018, 2019, 
did we have better options for finding these turtles in the wild? We contracted with the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley because they were game to try different techniques to find the turtle. You know, historically, turtle being shy, not taking to traps, it was really easy to have some survey bias. In this case, researchers had the most luck in places like the Devil's River. Well, that water is clear. So if the turtle tried to swim away, you can just keep an eye on it. So if they weren't showing up in the Rio Grande, where we're talking more like looking for something in chocolate milk, is it because of the Rio Grande or is it because we can't find them? So with that in mind, they he tackled, you know, really just took an entire arsenal with them out into the field. This first one, environmental DNA, is something that'll keep coming up throughout my presentation. The idea is pretty simple, um, albeit a little disturbing. <laughs> the idea is that, say you take a bath and you get out of the bath water. Well, any given amount of time later, a scientist can come into the bathroom and sample that water. And in there, they'll find your DNA and shed skin cells and hair and genetic material. Researchers at UT RGB wanted to apply that for turtles living in rivers. They were gonna back that up with drones, fitting drones with high resolution cameras that could hover over the river without spooking them, um, really played into capturing pictures of kind of a obviously red turtle. And of course, we always encourage old fashioned binoculars. Um, you know, sort of this wide arsenal, wide range ended up being really cool um, for scientific purposes. Here, they were covering 50 more river miles than had been done anytime in the near past. It worked. Um, here's a map of a recent final report that we've received from UTRGV. That's roughly just over 60 dots, and they found turtles in over 40 of them. Folks that are familiar with this part of the state will recognize that up here in the top left-hand corner, we've got spots on the Pecos. And surprisingly, quite a few turtles all across the Rio Grande. This has large implications on our understanding of water quality impacts on a potentially endangered or threatened species. So I'll stop right here, kind of give away my next section and, and ask who here actively uses or has an iNaturalist account? Excellent, so let me launch that poll for you. iNaturalist is such an important tool. And it looks like it's really good news. <laughs> so about 75% have voted already. Wow. Um, yeah. So I'll just give it a few more seconds to let more people vote. And our Texas Nature Tracker, so our Wildlife uh, Diversity Division uses iNaturalist a lot. So um, for City Nature Challenge and Biodiversity Blitz. All right, so I'll close it and I'll share the results. So 80% of the audience um, uses iNaturalist and 20% does not. All right, well, I think in this presentation, I can convince that 20% to get on board, um, unless you're out there just not using phones, which is just cool in its own way. You know, iNaturalist is really cool from my position because it's this real-time database that anyone can access. These folks, while they were out finding turtles any way they could, contributed over 90 posts to INAT. And you can go on there now and see some of the work that they've done. Um, and what's really cool is not only are we seeing how many turtles they've seen, you know, roughly, um, we're also seeing where. Here we're back on the main stem of the Rio Grande. This is a turtle that was caught using a water hazard at the Eagle Pass golf course. We're revisiting some of these earlier conversations about how water quality might affect the species and what habitat it prefers. 
And this is really going to broaden the narrative about what a cooter, Rio Grande cooter in particular, likes. There were other advantages of this project that I think I'd, you know, this group in particular might like to know. Um, you might have seen on the last slide that there were dots on both sides of the river. And some of these new conversations about technology can be applied both here and across the border in Mexico. Now, speaking of the border, you're not going to sit on the bank of the river with a pair of binoculars and not get noticed. Um, but it ended up you know, working out. You've got some staff, in this case Border Patrol, that are on the river on a regular basis. And a few of them are keeping their eye out for animals. And that actually led to new leads on where we might be able to find Rio Grande cooters. So kind of putting the brackets on this project, so what? You know, you went out, you had a fun bio blitz, you found all these turtles across a different basin. Well, here we have a picture of somebody like on one of the major reservoirs, I think it might be Amistad um, in the Rio Grande. Well, the Rio Grande cooter is not alone. This basin is going to see that federal backlog keep catching up to them. If it's not going to be this turtle, it'll be a fish, it can be a freshwater mussel. There's a lot of species that are going to be affected by a common habitat. And it's a big advantage anytime we're studying aquatic systems. Because some of these relationships can be studied in greater detail. Kind of along that line of new, you know, kind of encountering many species at once, I'd like to take it into our estuaries conversation. Starting with a quick poll question. Let me launch this one. So which of the following flows into Matagorda Bay? The Colorado River, Brazos River, San Antonio River, or the Guadalupe or Guadalupe River? <laughs> We're at 20 seconds. All right, this is a pretty good spread. So let me close the poll and I'll share the results. So 46% said Colorado, 22% said Brazos, 9% said San Antonio, and 22% Guadalupe. Hey, nice. Well, our Colorado River folks got the answer. Um, really, I was trying to play some tricks because that hasn't necessarily always been the case. Originally, the Colorado River flowed into Matagorda Bay and it presented a lot of challenges for the folks living there. If it wasn't floods coming through the Colorado, it was sediment building up in the Delta. Well, eventually, folks wanted to prioritize different things, things like shipping. And they decided to dredge the Colorado River and connect it down to the Gulf of Mexico. This essentially created Matagorda Bay, which we'll talk about today, and then separated its furthest eastern arm, um, which is now East Matagorda Bay. More recently, folks like Texas Parks and Wildlife came back to the table and decided that the Colorado River needs to flow into Matagorda Bay. And so that's one of the major freshwater inflow contributors to this system. Brazos River is just slightly up the coast. Um, San Antonio will flow into the Guadalupe that flows into the San Antonio Bay. And that's just down the coast from Matagorda. So I referenced, how do we handle a sweep of imperiled or threatened and endangered species? In the case of Matagorda, there's quite a few. And these are many species that are already threatened or endangered, and many have been for a long time. The Kemp's Ridley sea turtle is one, one considered, you know, a critically endangered sea turtle. Well, it's nesting off of South Texas, and then many of them are seen munching on crabs off the coast of Louisiana. Well, how does 
a place like Mount Agorda fit into that narrative. Looking back, all of those species are using a part of the ecosystem. And taking a limited amount of resources and deciding how we can tackle a region and start to gain insight into what's going on across the habitat that different species are accessing, we lead ourselves to more comprehensive studies. In Matagorda Bay, this hasn't really been done before. Um, there have been different ecosystem or habitat oriented studies, but it's important to come in and get a baseline understanding as we navigate long-term change. On the coast, this is very real. Coastal erosion, sea level rise, storm surge. We want to have a good understanding of habitat that could be available to some of our threatened, endangered, or imperiled species now so that we can conserve into the future. Important to Matagorda Bay as well is, you know, with the exception of the photo you see here, we don't see quite as an economically developed region. And I'm just, I'm comparing it to the Port of Houston and Texas City or the Corpus Christi Bay. Um, really, Matagorda Bay has a strong shrimp fleet and a lot of recreational fishing. And some of their main economic drivers are in fact closely related to the quality of the habitat. So here's the approach we're trying to take. We partnered with the university, oh no, Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, sorry, that was my UT showing, um, and their partners in College Station and Galveston to really start to draw a comprehensive picture in the health of this area. Now, this is a breakdown of our research tasks. They're about halfway through this research contract. And I won't read them off to you, but instead I want you to visualize, we're starting with a tool, in this case, a map, uh, one that not only shows us surface habitats, and kind of specifically talking about marsh, um, but also things underneath the surface seagrass beds, oyster reefs, muddy bottom that different species access. Researchers are coming in and surveying those areas and trying to pull all, all variety of aquatic life from different life stages and compare that to their, you know, sort of where they're occupying space in the bay and also what sort of water quality impacts are influencing these relationships. So this is what it looks like on a map, you know, for as large of a project it is, Matagorda Bay is a large place and we're happy to tackle just under half of it. The exception you see here are the orange dots. They're the locations of acoustic receivers. Previously on the last slide, I included sea turtle movement. Researchers, you know, associated with Texas Sea Grant and College Station are in the bay catching the turtles that are using that habitat and putting both short range and long range tracking devices on them so we can understand where they're hanging out. Are they using a particular seagrass bed? Well, then we can send biological sampling in and saying, well, what kind of qualities of the seagrass bed might be influencing the sea turtle's preference for it? And can those qualities be you know, reiterated in other parts of the bay? So I right here, kind of moving the other tasks aside, you're left with the water quality sampling locations. Um, to reference back to our poll question, here on the far right side of the screen, just inside that yellow boundary, is sort of the new and improved Colorado River Delta. So essentially our researchers are sampling along a salinity gradient as water moves from the Colorado watershed to the left, to where the bay connects with the Gulf. Now, this work is done largely in situ, and we're trying to collect information like salinity, temperature, nutrients, and even chlorophyll, you know, something to tie us into plankton, to grasp that abiotic influence on community composition and biological productivity. 
What I mean here is, is salinity influencing the distribution of different species? You know, in the bay, we have different fish, crabs, and everything in between. They have ideal salinity thresholds, and they're going to occupy habitats that provide that for them. Biological productivity is referencing sort of how plankton really kick off this whole process. What's eating what, and how is that kind of energy moving around the bay? My favorite part of this project is that our water quality PI, Dr. Mike Wetz, is actively using citizen scientists to collect this information. Um, in addition to that, we're trying to keep the general public up to date on what we're doing. It's a webinar, so I didn't stick too many hyperlinks into it, but I encourage you to go onto our website, you know, Googling Texas Comptroller Natural Resources, and exploring some of these products we're putting out for Matagorda and other projects. But if you would like to be a citizen scientist out on the water, um, with the caveat that I think we're all trying to be sensitive to our COVID-19 situation, um, please let me know and I can connect you to our researchers. Okay, so I'm going to launch the poll. Um, and with launching this poll, just so I'll let you guys know, if you do answer yes, um, I will be uh, taking those responses and um, sending the yeses to, um, to Chelsea. So if you answer yes, um, I will pass your email um, address to her. So give it a few more seconds for people to answer. All right, so let me close that and I'll just share. Um, so 15% said yes, 66 no, and 20% um, maybe and 66%. Um, if you're in the panhandle, I can understand why you may not um, be able to. <laughs> so I will send um, the yeses to you, Chelsea, afterwards. The other thing uh, before I forget, um, the link to the uh, your programs, I will put on the Texas Water Specialist website for people to easily access as well too. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I look forward to connecting anyone who said yes to our PIs down in Corpus Christi. Um, I hope it's a process that you can get hands on in and, and have some fun. I wanted to keep moving and kind of you know, try to touch on parts of the state where some of our audience might be today. The theme you'll see repeated throughout is kind of fighting off a big piece and looking at more than one species at a time. One species is rewarding, don't get me wrong. You can have an iNaturalist account, you can find more than you ever thought you could about something like the Rio Grande Cooter. But we're still working within limited time and resources. And anywhere that we can eliminate redundancy or capture some of this overlap, we wanna take advantage of those opportunities. It is so clear in East Texas you know, initially we were funding single species research on some freshwater mussels, Louisiana pigtail, Texas heel splitter. And in talking to communities and partners, we ended up kind of getting funny stories from the field. You know, there was one researcher was scuba diving somewhere in East Texas looking for mussels and he aggravated an alligator snapping turtle. And that's the kind of information that we want to be prepared to capture and sort of fill in a lot of these habitat conversations, including water quality, about the long-term conservation of these species. So as you can see here, we've got a lot going on in East Texas. Um, oops, spoiler. And the idea is having a lot of conversations early to figure out how we can tackle this. Generally, we know we want to take an ecosystem approach because once again, there's this benefit of occupying rivers and streams and having conversations about how they're connected. It also expands into reservoirs and ephemeral wetlands. This picture is always you know, one that makes me smile. Essentially, we have staff from the lower 
Natchez Valley Authority. Hope I got. And um, one of our researchers from the University of Texas, Tyler. Essentially, they're holding freshwater mussels and they're talking about freshwater mussels in their basin. No one really knows the river better than folks that are engaged in water quality. And that includes a lot of people tuning in today. In Texas, we have a different relationship with their surface water than other parts of the world. And there's really a select few that are going out there on a regular basis to notice change. And that's where a group like this can have a really big impact on our conservation of even threatened and endangered species. So we're kicking off, you know, trying to take this systematically. And maybe you're thinking it's a nice, nice spiel about ecosystems, but now you're describing a species. Well, it's of course complicated. Ecosystems bring with them a lot of complexities. And we're still working in an act that's concerned with species. So it's a compromise. But what we're doing is trying to inform the same stakeholders, folks concerned about mussels or concerned about alligator snapping turtles and keeping them up to date on the Western chicken turtle. Now we just kicked off this project. Um, once again, we're gonna throw some eDNA into the mix and see if new survey techniques can help us find this turtle across the state. Once again, a shameless plug for iNaturalist. I actually grew up just west of Houston where that big sort of orange line is. And lo and behold, there was a Western chicken turtle trying to nest in my folks' neighbor's front yard. I mean, you know, in this part of the state, we see turtles a lot. I know driving around, they're crossing the roads and among them could be Western chicken turtles. Even the alligator snapping turtle, which doesn't like to be found, you know, over a third of our occurrence records for that species have come through INAP. So as these Texas initiative continues, you know, folks can stay involved once again, you know, especially now as we're figuring out how to communicate more electronically, public meetings and webinars and story maps are going to be a great avenue to stay up. And finally, you know, in case you were thinking it, I always like to address this question. How did the Western chicken turtle get its name? All right, let's launch this fun one. And just looking at the results now, this is the fun part of uh, these polls is that interaction, and this is a great one. All right, so let me close the poll. And I'm going to share the results. And 54% said they make the cluck like sound, 30% say they have long necks, 8% um, because no one knows why they cross the road, and then 8% they taste like chicken. All right, well, in this case, the winner is long necks. Um, for this project, we're working with the University of Houston at Clear Lake, but there's been long-term enthusiasm coming out of a bunch of folks at Texas A&M University. And I encourage you to plug this species into Google and see some of their resources. They, they have great pictures on how to ID turtles, including that characteristic neck. For the taste like chicken answer, you know, I'm relieved a lot of folks didn't go that direction. Um, we are concerned about the status of the species, so we're not going to test this hypothesis anytime soon. Finally, last but not least, um, how are we going to tackle a place where no one can go? The Edwards Aquifer is, you know, always been kind of secret and occult, and groundwater itself is a conservation challenge for a lot of different groups. It's actually a habitat and an ecosystem for a wide range of species. And that's salamanders, catfish, and creepy crawlies like invertebrates. 
once again, we're applying you know, this approach. How can we tackle a survey for a bunch of species at once in order to inform conservation over the long haul? And Edwards Aquifer, that's critically important. Some of y'all may recognize these are some of the fastest growing counties in the state. The I-35 corridor is seeing a lot of change and that may have impacts on the species living underneath it. But you can't go so far as to articulate the full extent of those impacts if you don't know how many animals are under the surface right now. So I was sort of moving, you know, maybe our most complete or our least complete projects. Here, the ink on the contract isn't dry, so I can't spill too many details, but we are just so close. We're really excited that eDNA and testing that bathwater might be a great approach to the Edwards Aquifer. That, of course, will mean access to groundwater wells. Um, so in case you're sitting on one, you know, don't, don't be shy and feel free to contact us because I think that, you know, if eDNA can be feasible, we're going to have a really cool understanding across a large region of the Edwards. Our goal here is to collect these water samples and keep them safe. We're talking about salamanders. There's quite a few on the work plan, some already listed. But in the long term, we're going to see conversations about a lot of different species. And putting these water samples aside, where maybe eDNA is feasible, maybe it improves over time, maybe our understanding of the species change we can continue to revisit that resource and understand the Edwards a little more. With that, that's all I've got today. If I didn't cover a particular basin you might be interested in, odds are we might have a species there. So please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, there were a few that came through and um, anybody you're more than welcome to still uh, ask them. Just trying to expand my little box so I can see them. All right, so we'll go back up to the top and if anybody was having audio issues, um, sometimes it's uh, possibly Wi-Fi, um, but some people, um, the audio still was not working. Uh, the recording, I was able to hear um, Chelsea fine the whole time. So maybe the recording has a better audio um, and you can view that. I should be posting it by the end of um, the week, if not sooner. Um, let's see. So the first question is, wasn't the original ESA supposed to protect critical habitat and species um, were only supposed to be used as indicators for the overall health of the critical habitat? Well, the way we're approaching the Endangered Species Act now is a species-centric approach. Now, the service has to designate critical habitat when they decide to list a species. Um, this is challenging, and we're seeing a lot of debate carry on in the court system when we're not only defining habitat, but then what makes habitat critical. So I think that's an issue to keep an eye on because I think the interpretation will change depending on who's asking. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, is the citizen science water monitoring part of the Texas Stream Team program or um, is it um, solely with um, the comptroller's office or another program? The water quality for Matagorda Bay that I was describing today is run through our research contract with Texas A&M Corpus Christi. There is some stream team interest in that area. And in fact, there's a lot of agencies that are trying to improve water quality in the Bay. Um, I'd ha be happy to point you towards those resources. Please look into stream team. There's also the Texas Water Resources Institute LCRA is engaged in citizen science as well as the TCEQ. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, and this has Texas always tasked the CPA with leading the ESA process in the state? And if not, why did the ta uh, state task the CPA to lead the ESA process? Sure. So we were founded through political action in the legislature. We were written into code um, during a time when popular opinion around the Endangered Species Act was anything but that the Endangered Species Act was threatening the Texas economy. And we've seen examples of species listings that can be scary. When you're having a conversation about the Edwards Aquifer, what does federal interference in development of that aquifer look like? So that was some of the attitudes that sort of conceived our program. And we've since found that we're, we're filling a niche and we can be a valuable partner to a lot of different folks that are working on the same issue. All right, thank you. Is your office involved with the golden cheek warbler? It seems as if there is a push by the Texas land office to have it delisted. We haven't been involved in the golden cheek warbler in quite some time. There was a previous comptroller, Susan Combs, that was passionate about that species. But since my tenure here and the tenure of Glenn Hager, that species hasn't been on our radar. Okay. Where will the eDNA library be located? We would like to keep it with the university that we contract with. Um, universities across the state have natural biodiversity collections. Um, and of course, we'll articulate that once we can announce the concept. Okay, thank you. This is another eDNA and it's a, a general one. Where can you get more information about eDNA? You know, I'm, you know, I'm a millennial, I'll admit it. I go straight to the internet. Um, there's a lot of buzz about it in the Pacific Northwest, particularly managers, resource managers that are concerned with things like salmon or bull trout. Um, so I would suggest maybe you try to fine tune your search into those species and you can see how governments and universities are trying to apply these things. Okay, thank you. <laughs> What is the status of the comptroller's role with the listing of endangered native mussels? Is the comptroller's office still working on this species? Definitely. Um, the thing is that Texas, in fact, has a bunch of freshwater mussels, and we've got different research projects depending on the basin. Um, we previously worked in the Rio Grande. Um, our most recent contract close was in Central Texas, as well as East Texas. So if you get on our website, you can sort of explore what we've done recently. Um, I think we'll continue to keep our eye on freshwater mussels, and if needed, we can pursue more research. Okay, thank you. Um, is there work being done for the playas and the panhandle and species associated with them? Not directly with the playas. Um, I think that's an area that we can keep an eye on and it's certainly going to be subject to long-term change. But thinking off the top of my head, the closest we've gotten is the spot-tail earless lizard, which is still south, it's in the Edwards Plateau, and the Texas kangaroo rat, which is more in our Red River Basin to the west of Dallas. So keep an eye out, we might make our way over there um, as we monitor research priorities. Okay, cool. Just a few more left. Um, which threatened species exist in the Bahia Grande? Well, the Bahia Grande is part of the, you know, Laguna Madre system and a little bit of the South Texas thorn scrub. So I'm, I'm sort of speaking off the cuff here, but you've got a combination of migrating birds and folks, well, folks, you know, birds that might access that area, as well as some of our thorn scrub critters, ocelots, and while we haven't seen them in a long time, jaguarundi. In those cases, those mammals are in fact endangered, but threatened birds are certainly walking through the coast um, every year. 
Okay. What happens when a threatened species is petitioned for endangered status but is not listed? Can they reapply later? How long do they have to wait? They certainly can petition again. Um, we've seen this often. A lot of times the service will preclude for a listing. So sort of weird language to me, but it generally means that Yes, we understand that there might be some evidence that the species warrants protection, but we don't have enough information to say that definitively. So a lot of times, not only do you want to come back and revisit the issue with service, but you want to come back with more information. Okay. Do you have any research projects you are planning to announce soon? We're really excited to announce the Edwards Aquifer research as soon as we can. Um, that really just feels like days away. Um, otherwise, keep an eye out for East Texas. I showed a long list of species and I'm hoping that some of our public work group meetings can lead to research projects. Okay, I believe this is the last one. Um, they live in Ector County. Um, are there any projects in West Texas? We're always keeping an eye on West Texas, and I say that that way because West Texas is, in fact, many different places. Um, in Ector County, we're keeping an eye on species like the dune sagebrush lizard. Um, there's unlikely overlap with the spot-tailed earless lizard. Um, but it's definitely, you know, species can change over time. All right, fantastic. Um, so I'm just gonna take control over to the screen really quick. And there it is. Um, and so thank you so much, Chelsea, for um, a wonderful presentation uh, today. And um, this is where um, I will list the recorded webinar as well as uh, Chelsea's PowerPoint. And I will put the link to um, the natural resources program here as well for people to reference later. Uh, the people that were interested in Matagorda Bay um, or any interest, you're more than welcome to email me. Um, my email address is on all the GoToWebinar uh, confirmation pages and reminders as well as you can use that email address to send me any interest for the Texas Aquatic Science Curriculum Review and submissions. Thank you so much. We're gonna end actually two minutes early today. So thank you everybody and enjoy the sunshine out there.